future on the technology track, we will be having Trisha Seuss, president of the Virtual Foundry, talking about microwaves and tech of metal filament fabrication of the product. So, will you give it up to you? Uh, Hi, Janet. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining my talk today. I'm going to be talking about microwave centering of metal fused filament fabrication printed parts. So many words. We're going to boil it down. It's metal 3D printed parts that you're going to debind and center in a household microwave. Crazy. I know. Let's hear all about it. I'm going to work on sharing my screen so I can present to you. Uh, just a moment. Okay, here we go. So yes, uh, we just heard about the title of the presentation. I'm Trisha Cease with the Virtual Foundry. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the agenda for today. So we're going to, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, my um, co-founder, and the Virtual Foundry, you're going to hear about FFF Metal Basics and the general process. So that's how it's happening now. And then hear about microwave sintering and how that changes the process a little bit, the equipment that you need to do it, what that process is like, some of the results that we've seen so far. And then I have a couple of slides of info and um, resources if you want to look further into it. So let's go. Um, I'm, as I said, with Virtual Foundry, my co-founder, Brad Woods, um, is the our inventor. He does everything science. He is the man who invented filament, our metal, glass, and ceramic FFF 3D printing filaments. So let's back up and talk about FFF, fused filament fabrication. That's that really common style of 3D printing. I'm sure you're all very familiar with it. Also called FDM, fused deposition modeling. And another newer term that we're seeing is BME, bound metal extrusion, all um, the same um, technologies. And the Virtual Foundry makes these filaments that are loaded with metal, glass, or ceramic, and they print on standard FFF, FDM style, 3D printers. So it's metal additive manufacturing that's fully hands-on because you have control over every step of the process and it's fully in-house. So you're doing everything in your studio or lab. The microwave centering topic is based on the work of one of our partner innovators. That's our word for our customers. And he goes by Highball. So if you look for him on YouTube, you can Google Mr. Highball and you'll see a, um, a drawn image of him in his leather apron of working in his workshop. So um, he's the one who's done the most work with microwave sintering. When we hear and see about the results, you're seeing the work that he's done so far. So FFF Metal basics. It's this three-step process that you may be really familiar with in FFF metal. So you're going to print and we start with uh, bound metal powder, powder. So we take a pretty standard PLA, 3D printing plastic, and load it up with metal powder. Uh, so that's how these filaments can actually print very similarly to plastic in standard FDM FFF 3D printers. It's using that layering technique um, that we all know about. Now, step two is to get that binder out of there, right? So you're going to do some kind of heat treatment. The, the different technologies in the FFF metal space use different methods for debinding. With the virtual foundry, we're using heat in a regular kiln. And then the third step of that process to get a full metal part is to center those metal particles together. So the piece is not being melted together, but rather the individual particles of metal are being joined at the edges. So that's the sintering process. Now, the way that we do this currently is that you bury your print in a refractory ballast in a crucible. So that small imaged kind of um, 
to the center right shows a crucible with some stuff in it. So you're going to bury your part in that stuff in the crucible. The, the um, refractory ballast, or that stuff that I keep calling it, is designed to support the part shape through this process. So rather than printing, um, rather than leaving printed supports on your part, you're going to remove your printed supports, bury your part in this ballast, and now your part shape is fully supported. Then you're going to place that crucible in a standard kiln and run the prescribed time and temperature profile. The second step of that is to prepare for sintering. We're going to add sintering carbon to manage oxygen during the sintering process. A couple of more steps to prepare that crucible. Back into the regular kiln it goes and you're running a prescribed time and temperature profile to center these parts. So a question came up, how accurate can the user calculate the change in size of the 3D part that occurs after the centering process? That's a great question. It applies throughout the whole conversation today. It's about shrinkage. So as your metal particles are fusing together in centering, they will shrink. So um, if you are following the instructions that we post on our website, you can expect seven to 10% shrink. So in that regard, then you will size your part up about seven to 10% in the modeling stage. You'll print it a little bit larger and then you can expect it to shrink by that amount following the prescription or the following the recipe that we provide. Now you have full control over this process. So you can adjust the time and temperature profile to further densify your parts, meaning you will also shrink them a little bit further. Now, what's up with microwave sintering? I'll tell you, when I first heard about microwave sintering, I thought it must be some kind of special microwave, um, some sort of industrial, commercial, special machine. And I was surprised and thrilled to find out that no, it's a standard household microwave. Now, microwave sintering is very much in the experimental phase. So I'm sharing with you what we know so far, but it's at the very beginning. So I'm not going to be able to give you any kind of um, official process uh, for you to go off and try it on your own. So telling, what, telling you what we know so far, but please understand it is in the developmental phase. Microwave sintering is going to follow the same basic process. So you are loading a crucible and you're running a debind cycle. You're loading a crucible, meaning you're burying your part in that refractory and you're running a center cycle. So your part is still going through that same three-step process, print, debind, center. What's different with microwave centering is the equipment that you use for debind and center. So you can see there it's a standard household microwave, and that's the microwave part of it. And then the other image there of that white container with the lid lying there is what's called a microwave kiln. So microwave sintering is in use today in other industries like glasswork and glass beading. So this is a this is a common item that you can find on Amazon. It's called a microwave kiln. It's two pieces. It's the cup, we'll call it, and then the lid as well. It's white around the outside, and you can see that it's gray around the inside, and that gray part is metal. It's um, likely silicon carbide. That silicon carbide it acts as a heat concentrator for those microwaves. So what's really cool about this process is that you can get to higher temperatures than you can with a regular kiln, and you can do it much more quickly. I will give you an idea of how to go through that process in a second. So the equipment and supplies that you need. A standard microwave. Now these come in different wattages, 600, 900, 1100 watt, at least here in the US. A microwave kiln as well that we talked about. That's that little container. You can buy those commercially. Um, as I said, you can get those on Amazon. You can see in the photo that it has a little hole in the bottom. That hole will need to be plugged. Um, you can also build your own. And I do have a resource available for you if you want to go down that road. 
you're still going to need your debind and center refractory ballast, as we talked about, that's providing the part shape um, for your part as it goes through the heat process, centering carbon to manage that oxygen, and then some standard safety equipment, heat resistant gloves. You'll need an infrared heat gun thermometer to test your temperature. Um, you'll also want to make sure that the process is well ventilated or you do it outside. A microwave is a pretty easy piece of equipment to move outside or in a garage or things like that. So we talked about the microwave kiln, that container. So that metal inside of it acts as a heating element. The elements inside that crucible in that microwave kiln replace the heating elements in a regular kiln. So you're essentially moving the elements, the heat, from the, the larger piece of equipment to the container that holds your part. The crucible is doing its normal job that is supporting the part, but it's also concentrating the heat. So think about a hot pocket. You take your hot pocket out of the freezer, you have to put it in that weird paper sleeve that has the silver inside of it. And that silver lining in the hot pocket paper concentrates that microwave heat so that your hot pocket can get heated properly. So uh, the question, do I understand correctly that the process can safely microwave center metal parts? And yes, that is exactly what I'm saying. The next question might be, why doesn't it blow up? We've always been told not to put metal in a microwave. And if you have ever tried it, because you need to see for yourself, you may have seen a crumpled up piece of foil or a fork or something like that. So what's different here and the reason why it's not going to uh, spark or explode like a metal in a microwave is because that metal is fully insulated. So looking at that microwave kiln, it's got that ceramic material or aluminum material mm -hmm. outside of it. It's insulating that metal from the microwaves pulling in the heat and the same with your metal part inside that crucible or microwave kiln as it's technically named it's also insulated from creating an actual arc so it's when a metal object is allowed to create an arc with a microwave that you get a, that you get trouble but in this case all of it is insulated so that's not happening now you need to know how hot your microwave gets or how hot your microwave can make your microwave kiln, that container. And there is a way to figure that out so that you know how to properly run your time and temperature profile. So you're going to calibrate your microwave um, so you know how long and at what power levels to run it to get the temperatures you want. So you'll put your empty microwave kiln, that cup, that container, in the microwave, run the microwave at low power for five minutes, test the temperature of the microwave kiln with an infrared heat gun thermometer. You'll note that a microwave kiln goes back in the microwave, run that microwave another five minutes at low power, test the temperature of your microwave kiln again, and you're gonna keep doing that over and over until you fully under until you understand where it's going to top out, where the temperature will max out at low power. And then you'll do that whole process again at medium power and that whole process again at high power. So I mentioned Highball, who's doing a lot of work with microwave sintering. He has now accumulated three microwaves at the three different wattage levels. So he's going back and forth through these three microwaves as he knows, um, the amount of time to leave his to leave the power running and at what power level. So the state of the technology today, that is you're using a stand hold, standard household microwave, dictates that you will need to go through this calibration process because there isn't a piece of equipment that's all set up for this today. It will probably come in the future. Um, but today where we are, you'll have you'll put in a little bit of upfront work to understand your microwave temperature capabilities. So as I mentioned, there isn't, this is a brand new process. There is, there, there's no set program. You will have to put some time into it to figure out what your equipment can do. Now, some of the results so far, um, 
Highball chose to start with aluminum, which is one of the more difficult materials to sinter because it's reactive in the presence of oxygen and heat, which complicates things. And it also requires a very special atmosphere. So not something you can normally sinter in a piece of common kiln equipment like you can with our other materials like copper, bronze, and steel. But he started there, he went for the fullest challenge he could embrace. Um, but he's getting some really cool results um, that show a lot of promise. So a lot of failures as he's working through the process, but some really cool successes as well. So very experimental. You can see a couple of results. These pieces are both aluminum. The small outcroppings on these parts were delicate. They did go through a normal shrinkage process, which we talked about earlier, and will apply to microwave sintering as it does to standard kiln sintering. Now the part on the left is strong. He could hit it with a hammer and it survived. So as he gains more experience and more knowledge about the process, he's getting better and better results. He continues to work with aluminum, so adding to the challenge. We do have another partner innovator who worked the microwave sintering process with copper and got some really cool initial results. So yes, in the research stage, but you can do some really cool things with it still at this point. So the info and resources on this page, and feel free to reach out to me and I can give you these things uh, more specifically so you can find them if you'd like to get the exact equipment that we know is in use today. That infrared heat gun thermometer, for sure, you'll need that to know how hot your crucible is. Some flux. So Highball is using flux rather than sintering carbon, especially for the aluminum, because it has these special uh, sintering requirements. Each particle of aluminum is coated with an oxide, and that oxide layer needs to be removed in order for the aluminum particles themselves to join together. And it's removing that oxide layer from the aluminum that really presents that challenge. Other materials don't have that issue, copper, bronze, the steels, irons. You can debind and center those in standard kiln equipment because you don't have to um, manage that oxide layer. Um, so in Highball's experiments with microwave sintering and choosing a challenging material at first, he's going the flux route for that part. Another resource for the heat resistant gloves, the regular old microwave kiln um, on Amazon. So microwave kiln again is that container, which are readily available commercially for under $50. But Highball makes his own. So he uses some ref castable refractory cement and then he will 3D print with the virtual foundry silicon carbide, the heating element part of that. So you saw that silver lining in the microwave kiln in that crucible. Highball is 3D printing that silicon carbide lining into these crucibles that he's making himself. So how big can the part be? Or maybe a uh, better question, how big is the kiln? So this is a question that we get a lot. The side, the upper limits of part size with the virtual foundries filament are truly untested, right? So um, there aren't really, today we don't have a limit. We haven't seen what it is. And as the technology advances, the limits will increase and increase. So your part size is going to be dependent on your hardware. How big is your printer? How big is your kiln or microwave? How big is the crucible that you have to um, put your part in for the debind and center process? Um, also, how big is the kiln? So kilns range in size, if we're talking about a standard kiln. Kilns range in size from small desktop um, units for the dental industry to um, gigantic industrial kilns and furnaces that you can drive a car into. So those really run the gamut of size and that will depend on how big 
the parts you want to make will depend on how large a kiln you source. We do have a few available on our website that's a pretty standard size. Now, if you're talking about microwave sintering, we're focused here on commercial microwaves. So those come in fairly standard sizes. They don't get overly large. You're always fitting it onto your counter. There are microwaves that are more commercial or industrial that get a little bit larger uh, that you could use. But starting out in this process, you're going to do a little bit smaller parts. The FFF metal process by the Virtual Foundry ideal part size fits within a four inch volume, but certainly there are exceptions to that. Does the Virtual Foundry offer steel FFF filament? If yes, what percent of steel is the final part and what kind of steel? So yes, we do offer three steel versions of FFF filament, 316L, stainless steel 316L, stainless steel 17.4, and Incanal 718. What percent steel is the final part? The final part after you've gone through the debind and sinter process is 100% metal. If you're asking about the density of the part, how dense is that after sintering? If you're following the instructions on our website with steel, you'll see about 10% shrink, which will result in about 80 to 85% density. If you adjust your time and temperature to further shrink your part down to about 20% shrink, then you're getting more above the 90s percent in density. What printer and slicer do you use for your FFF? Um, that's an excellent question. You can use any FFF FDM style 3D printer that accepts any brand of filament. So there are some that require their own specific branded filaments. If they, uh, there are only two or three brands that are doing that, all the rest of them are open. The print printers with direct drive work better than those with Bowden tube. And you also want to be able to, to change your nozzle fairly easily. There are filaments ask for a hardened steel nozzle sized at 0 0.6 millimeters or larger. So you need, it's helpful if you can easily get at your nozzle to apply the hardened version and a little bit larger than plastics are used to. Does your company offer 2.85 millimeter diameter filament for Maker, Ultimaker? And absolutely, yes, we do. We do have several of our partner innovators using Ultimaker machines. We've heard of people having great success with Prusa. Uh, we enjoy the Creality brand in-house here. So really a wide range of printer options. The slicer is also very open. So your choice of technology, your choice of software, your choice of hardware. We like Cura because it's free and it works great. Um, Prusa comes with its own slicing program. So the, the slicer is up to you. We do have some resources on our YouTube channel that help you understand which parameters you should be paying attention to. But the most basic ones are a print temperature of 210 Celsius, which you can adjust up or down as you get going and a flow rate, an exaggerated flow rate of 135%. So the filament um, is thicker than standard. Uh, it's not thicker. I don't mean to say that. It's not thicker in diameter. It's a standard diameter, but it takes more energy to push it through the nozzle. So we're exaggerating that flow rate to 135% so that the 3D printer can apply more energy to push it through rather than being like... Um, melted plastic pushing through there, it's more like bread dough. So you're going to apply a little more energy toward pushing that through. And then finally, um, back to the info and resources here, the microwave is a standard household microwave that you can pick, from, pick up from Amazon or Walmart or your favorite discount retailer. If you want to learn more about this process, well, you can go to YouTube. First of all, you can always reach out to me, info at thevirtualfoundry.com. And I can supply these to you as well or take a screenshot. Um, info at, or I'm sorry, 
uh, more about microwave sintering and to look at the work that Highball has done, you can look at Mr. Highball's YouTube channel and you see the um, URL there at Mr. Highball on YouTube. The Virtual Foundry has a Discord server where people can talk to each other about what they're doing. Um, we're on Reddit too. I've mentioned our YouTube page a couple of times and there are a lot of resources there. We recently did a microwave sintering webinar with Highball so you can get the information firsthand from him. It's a few months old now. We did that last fall. So his YouTube channel will provide the most up-to-date information. Uh, will the Virtual Foundry share optimal slicer settings with customers for each of their filaments? Yes, absolutely. Your success is important. We will give you as much information as we can. There are the basic slicer settings are listed on our website, on the How to 3D Print Metal page. Our YouTube channel offers, um, I think there was an FAQ session that we did that get, goes into more detail with those slicer settings. What does the future hold? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. What kind of applications do I believe companies will explore with this technology? Well, the future, gosh, is wide open. So I think that we are at the beginning of the Star Trek replicator with 3D printing technology in general and being able to 3D print with metal in such an easy, accessible way gets us even closer to that. So applications where a lot of folks in research are working with the materials. So students at universities and higher education institutions around the world are studying it. Um, they are um, also looking at new ways of solving problems that couldn't be solved before. Um, my favorite applications are about space. I love hearing about the space applications. It's the next frontier. It's very important that we figure out how to be in space well. And it's exciting that um, the Virtual Foundry gets to be a part of that. So you'll hear more from us about space applications in the future. What are the biggest challenges we need to overcome to scale with your technology? Okay, that's a great question. So as you, um, you are going to dial in your process with your parts, um, we offer you um, a recipe, a set of instructions. Um, and then you'll you'll start there and you study your result and then make adjustments as you need. If you want a more dense part, you're going to adjust. If you um, want if you need to make adjustments to your process, you'll do that. And once you get that dialed in, you can repeat it over and over and over. So I think the biggest challenge would be that you've got a dial-in process with each part, shape, type. It wouldn't be each part, but each shape, type, if you got something long and thin, or if you got something a little bit more bulky, you're going to have to figure out and finesse uh, the process for those shape types. So I would say that is the biggest challenge to scaling. The most complicated shape that we've made, um, I'm going to say that is a, um, a manifold, I don't know if I'm gonna say the words right, but it's a single tube that branches off into many other tubes into a circle. There's a picture of it on our website if you find the showcase showcase page, you'll see lots of prints that have been done with our materials. So um, anything that 3D printing can do, these metal filaments can do. Do folks use generative design technologies with microwave sintering? Um, excellent question. Generative design is so good for this process. Has Have people done it specifically with microwave sintering? That part, I'm not sure, combining those two things, um, but it certainly could be done. Um, FFF metal filaments from the Virtual Foundry are perfectly designed for generative design and topological optimi optimization. So if you've got a part that you're doing that with and you want to try it out in metal, this is a great way to do that. Are there universities that offer your tech to students to experiment with today? Yes. So there are several universities that have um, additive manufacturing labs, or they've got general workshops, and they make this FFF metal technology available to their students. 
and I will not be able to name one for you off the top of my head. Wow, what an amazing presentation. And that Q&A session was quite dynamic. Thank you so much, Trisha, for sharing your yes. knowledge. As you can see in the general chat, everyone is so impressed with your explanation. And we hope that more people will pursue microwave sintering. So thank you so much for your time and appreciate yes. you. Thank you very much. If people want to find you uh, after the show, how, what's the best way for them to reach you? Info at thevirtualfoundry.com.